Okay, folks, good morning. Um, we are going to continue our discussion um, covering Chapter 9, Resonant Converters. Before that, uh, just a reminder that we are going to have our last quiz, quiz number 7, two weeks from today. Uh, so technically next week we are not going to have any classes because of the Thanksgiving break. But as soon as you guys come back during the last week of classes on Tuesday, we are going to have our last quiz, quiz number seven. Now the topics to be covered that are uh, basically this chapter, chapter nine, and more specifically uh, the Bach converter operating under zero current switching you know, conditions that we already covered, and the Bach converter operating under zero voltage switching, which is we started the discussion last time and we are going to actually wrap it up today. Now, uh, let me see how much we are going to go into the other types of converter. If we cover another one completely, that's also going to be included in the quiz. Okay, so chapter 9, we made discussions about, uh, ideally, we would like to have uh, the conditions. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Like, uh, last time when we were discussing the quiz number 6, right? Uh, there, uh, you mentioned V1. It's the uh, harmonic voltage, right? At M of equals to five, right? What was that? The voltage V one. Okay. That's a eighty point four. Right. Like it, that voltage was at M F equals to five. At M F equals to five. Yeah. For that particular frequency modulation index. Uh, yes. When you are calculating the RMS value for that one, you divide it by uh, root two. So is that voltage like a, is it a sine wave or is it? Yes, it's the fundamental harmonic of the output voltage. When you're talking about the harmonics of your output voltage, you're referring to the Fourier series, and all of these harmonics are sinusoidal harmonics. Yes. So, uh, but V0 is uh, like, uh, you know, V0 is the fundamental. It's, it's not a sine wave. Right. But you mean the harmonic, the harmonic waveform is a sine? The fundamental harmonic of a V out is a periodic waveform, right? Yeah. So any periodic waveform using the Fourier series could be described in terms of bunch of sinusoidal signals added with each other. Add the fundamental harmonic frequency twice that, three times that, four times that, and just go on, so on. So in the math card, uh, when, we, when we simulate that one at MX, we cost of five, is it a sinusoid? Like what is a sinusoid? Uh, the V1. V1 is always sinusoidal, right? V1 is the fundamental harmonic. V1 is the amplitude of that fundamental harmonic. So it is always sinusoidal, right? That's just by definition. It is always sinusoidal. As long as your output voltage is periodic, you can describe it in a series of basic sinusoidal signals. But you mean like if, MS, uh, if MF is uh, say 11? Like e even then, it's a sinusoidal at MF equals to 11. Like for all the MF, which is odd and. Uh, Say it again. If MF is 11, what happens? If MF is 11, and like even then we have a V1. E right. It's a sinusoid even at MF equals to 11. Yeah, it is always sinusoidal. See, basically, uh, let me see if I still have the file here. Uh, Okay, inverter PW1. Oops. All right, so we choose MF to be 5, for instance, right? Okay. So in this particular case, I have this red curve, which is my reference, sinusoidal reference, and the blue trace, which is the triangular waveform, five times the frequency of the red one. And according to bipolar switching logic, this is going to be your output voltage waveform, the red one. So it's just jumping from 100 to negative 100. Now, if, if you do Fourier analysis on this, and it doesn't matter what MF is, no, regardless of the value of MF, 5, 11, 39, whatever. If you do Fourier analysis on this, and by the way, Fourier analysis means multiply this signal by your uh, particular sine and cosine function and see on average how much these signals have, you know, projecting on each other. You will end up a frequency, frequency spectrum of this. 
So at the fundamental frequency, n equals to 1, you have this amplitude. For this particular wave, because there is some symmetry in the system, uh, there is some even symmetry in the system, there is no second harmonic, and there is a third one, there is no fourth one, and there is a fifth one. V1, which was reported over there, is actually this amplitude over here. The amplitude of the fundamental sinusoidal frequency that appears in the, in the output voltage. So technically, if I add, if I regenerate, reconstruct all of these signals and add them to each other, I should get a waveform like this. Now, unfortunately, this takes forever. So here, for instance, I'm just only trying to add the first two harmonics, and you can see it hasn't even calculated it yet. It did. So this is just this sinusoidal signal plus uh, this one. If you just add these to each other, you get this red curve which is not really similar to our output voltage, but if I just do all of them all together, like 40 of them to, to each other, they will get very close to each other. Now, uh, if you do MF of 17, same story. So it's a little bit busier because we are switching at a higher frequency now. And again, this is your output voltage. Again, it's a periodic waveform. You can describe it in a bunch of signed signals. and this is your fundamental frequency, again at 60 hertz. The fundamental frequency is determined by the frequency of your reference, basically, which is the red one here. And then, because MF is large, we don't have basically anything from 2 until 14. Then our first undesired harmonic is at 15. Then we have a large one at 17 and another one at 19, something like that. So uh, V1, again here, in this particular case, again, V1 is reflecting the amplitude of this signal over here. Okay? And actually, I have a, it has to calculate it, but uh, after it's done, it actually gives you like a vector of all of these. Yeah. In this particular case, V1 is 0.8, basically, the amplitude of that harmonic. Something like that. Is that answering your question or? Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, chapter 9, resonant converters. Ideally, we would like to have, if you are focusing on a particular switch, now this switch could be a real transistor or could even be your diode. Diodes are also considered passive switches here. Ideally, you would like to have it that when you are transitioning from the on state to the off state or vice versa, you would like to have at least the voltage or the current, or maybe both of the signals associated with that switch crossing zero. So that actually can minimize the overlap between the voltage waveform and the current waveform of that particular component during the switching transient, transient and therefore uh, <coughs> to minimize or even eliminate the switching losses. So this chapter is all about this. There is not a particular approach or solution that is applicable to all converters. Each converter has its own little you know, tricks. For instance, we have already analyzed the buck converter to be uh, to behave in a way that we have uh, zero current switching for the particular switch and also zero voltage switching for the diode. Uh, so this is the first one that we have analyzed. I just want to bring this to your attention that first of all, this is still the buck converter. What happens is. Uh, Okay, what happens is basically um, in, order, in order to reduce the order of the system, you always assume that this inductor is a relatively large inductor. So therefore, you just replace the right-hand side of the circuit with just the current source. So that just makes, much, uh, makes life much easier. So all you are focusing on is the resonating inductor that you have intentionally added and the resonating capacitor. And please pay attention that if I eliminate this inductor over here and eliminate this cap over here, it's basically our classic buck converter. Uh, now, these components may be external components and may not even be external components. For instance, CR could be the parasitic capacitance of your diode. Or maybe it could be an extra cap added to, be, to join with that parasitic cap that regardless of liking it or not, it's always here. And an extra cap in parallel with that internal cap to give you some CR. Or LR could be the impedance or the inductance of this loop plus some extra in inductor that you have added. 
We analyzed this one already, and just bringing this to your attention that some of the waveforms in the book may not be very accurate. For instance, in the first mode, if you focus on the current of the inductor, it was not a resonating inductor. It was just ramping up. So actually, there is a mistake over here. It shows it as if it is resonating, but this is just a very straight line. All right. So in the first mode, the switch is, uh, for instance, on or closed. The inductor energizes, and the diode is still on over here. And then at this point, T1, and that is when the current of the uh, resonating inductor reaches I out. And by the way, I out is this guy. I already have I out here. Uh, Diode turns off, so you can see there is a resonance behavior going on, and we had actually equations describing it. And it ends when the current of the resonating inductor tends to get negative, and that is not going to happen because we're assuming that this switch cannot conduct any currents in this direction. So when the current returns back to zero, it's a good time to turn the switch off. So you can actually achieve, argue that at this point, I have ZCS for the switch at turn off, basically. And I don't know why this is la lasting longer than that, because this is supposed to be closed over here. And then the diode is actually still uh, charged. So again, another mistake over here in this particular one coming from the book. This is not a resonance anymore. This is just a straight line. And this a straight line is caused by the output current source, which was I out, discharging the cap that is placed in parallel with the diode. And then finally, the last mode arrives. Nothing is really going on here. And you can co control the duration of the last mode, which indirectly controls your switching period and switching frequency to be able to regulate, for instance, your output voltage. And uh, the voltage transfer ratio of this converter looks like something like this. So in order to find this, uh, you have to find uh, the values, numerical values for T1, which was the duration of the first mode, then T2 minus T1, which is the duration of the second mode, and T3 minus T2, which is the duration of the, the third mode, and then combine them all together to be able to get the voltage transfer ratio. And if you plot it, it looks like something like this. Pay attention that on the x-axis, we are normalizing the switching frequency, which is Fs but F by F0, and F0 is the resonance frequency. So F0 is basically omega naught over 2 pi, which is... So this thing, keep that in mind. And also on the curves, as a parameter, we are using this lowercase r, which is actually our load value, rl, normalized by z0. And remember, z0 was the characteristic impedance, which was the square root of lr <coughs> over cr. So you can see things get a, lot, a little bit complicated. First of all, your voltage transfer ratio is dependent on the frequency. It is also dependent on the value of your load. And you have to be very careful when you choose the, the value for your LR and CR because they pretty much determine everything in the system. Uh, the next topology that we started discussing last time was this one. Again, it's a Bach topology. If I eliminate this cap, just take it out, and replace this inductor with a short circuit path, you're reduced down to just a classic Bach converter. Now, this time, we are placing the cap in parallel with the switch. So the basic rule of thumb is if you want to provide ZVS for a particular component, most likely you have to put a capacitor in parallel with that switch. And if you want to provide ZCS for the component in the system, immediately you should put an inductor in series with that component. So over here you can see immediately this cap is placed in parallel with our switch over here. So you can kind of expect to see some sort of a ZVS, zero voltage switching behavior. <coughs> Again, this resonating cap CR could be an internal component, the parasitic capacitance of the switch and the diode, could be an external component, component or most likely a combination of both. Um, this diode over here, uh, 
You can argue that my switch does not have a diode and you have not externally, externally added a diode. But as it turns out, having a diode over there doesn't really hurt us and actually provides a wider window for the switch to turn on. But again, if you, even if you take the diode out, you can still achieve ZVS and see what's going on. And similar to the previous case, uh, we just assume that on the output side, we have this relatively large inductor with a relatively constant current, which is the output current, basically, something like that. So we just analyze this. So any questions so far? All right, so what we are going to do today is going through different, uh, we already went through one or two modes last time. We're just going to repeat that a little bit and then go through details of uh, uh, the, the, the remaining modes that are there. So uh, uh, usually in, in classic converters, when you start the analysis, you say that my period just started, the switching period just started, and the switch just turned on at the beginning of the period. Over here, it makes more sense not to do that, and actually it makes more sense to say the switch just turned off at the beginning of the switching period. So you can see mode one, is a starting when we just turn the switch off. So before that, so before mode one, what was happening is the switch was on. So I'm not going to really draw the, the, the cap anymore because it's shorted. And the diode was off. Okay, something like this. So this is right before our switching period starts. So why do we care about this? Because we have to obtain the initial conditions for our first mode. So the initial conditions are uh, the voltage drop across this resonating cap, VCR, is zero, basically, right before this mode started. And in terms of initial value for this inductor, resonating inductor current, it is actually equal to I0. It's just conducting the same current. And in case we are interested in finding this voltage of Vx, which is the inverse of the voltage drop on the diode, uh, you can argue that this inductor is conducting a constant current. So there is no voltage drop across this inductor because the derivative of the voltage represents the slope of the current and there is no slope, so therefore there's zero volts over here. So Vx is the same as the input voltage. The reason that we are tracking Vx is uh, in the end when it comes to finding the voltage transfer ratio of the converter, it's easy just to focus on Vx, find its average value and say this is actually our output voltage. Uh, so that's why we are trying to, to track Vx. So there are three basically curves uh, or traces that we are interested to follow. One of them is what is happening to, let me see in what order I have them in my notes. Okay, what is happening to voltage drop across the switch or the resonating cap? They are basically the same because they are in parallel. And then what happens to the current waveform of the resonating inductor, which turns out to be the input current as well, because the, you can see it's actually placed in series with the source. So technically this current and the source current are the same. And also Vx, because in the end we want to find the average value of Vx and find the voltage transfer ratio. So let's also keep an eye on Vx. All right. So basically what happens in this mode is we just opened up the switch. So we have this constant current source flowing through the inductor and flowing through the resonating cap. And actually there's no resonance going on in this mode. And it is just this cap is just getting charged. So we have like a very straight line because our current source is almost a, co a constant current source. So this, the cap is getting charged. And ILR is the same as I out. All right. 
And if you look at Vx, um, Vx, let me draw it first and explain what it is. At the very beginning of this mode, Vx was equal to Vn. Okay, at the very beginning. But now because we have a charge, that, that we have a cap that is getting charged, so if you apply KVL around this loop, you would realize that Vn minus Vcr is Vx. So Vcr is rising, therefore Vx is falling, again a straight line, and all the way down to, to zero. Uh, how long is this mode going to last? This mode is going to last as long as Vcr is a smaller than the input voltage. All right. Because if VCR tends to get larger than the input voltage, that means VX is going to tend, is going to basically get negative. And remember, VX is also, there's a diode here as well. So VX doesn't have a chance to get negative. As soon as it returns back to zero, the diode kicks in, and then we are moving on to the next mode. So basically, T1 is the time that a VX returns to zero, or basically our diode turns on. Okay. So I just don't want to make that figure so, so busy. So basically, this is when diode D turns on. And if you look at the voltage drop across the diode, at the time that the diode turned on, the voltage of the diode was zero. So basically, we have a little bit of a ZVS going on over here for the diode. All right. And also, we just opened up the switch. So if you focus on the voltage drop across the switch, you can see ZVS for the switch at turn off. All right. All right. So, so far we know all we have to find out is what is the duration of this mode. Well, the duration of this mode can be determined by this equation, quite simple. We have a constant current source. How long does it take for this constant current source to charge our CR cap from zero to Vn? And that's just Vn CR over I0. So that's actually the duration of the first mode. All right, now the second, modes, the second mode is starts. So in the second mode, as we discussed, the diode turns on. All right, so now we have both LR and CR in the picture, and there is some resonance going on. Basically, what happens is uh, you can argue that this diode is going to freewheel, like a freewheeling mechanism for the output current. So the output current pretty, pretty much flows through the diode. And at the same time, there is a resonance going on over here. Okay, and as long as the current of the diode is positive, we can actually argue that this mode is going to last. So if you look at basically this mode, what is going on is we have this source, a DC source. We have a resonating cap, a resonating inductor, and that's pretty much it. All right. And if you look at the very basic concept circuits that we analyzed, this was, I think, the very first one that we analyzed. We called it the undamped, undamped series resonance circuit. And we had two equations for that. Uh, equation actually numbered one and two in my notes. Like equation number one describes the, the current waveform of the resonating cap. And equation number two describes the voltage waveform. We actually had this about a week ago. Uh, so I'm not going to write these equations. They are pretty much long. But anyway, the answer is actually here. So this comes from equation number one. And this one comes from equation number two. All right. The good thing is the initial conditions are in a way that some of these sine and cosine functions are going to be canceled out. OK, so it's a little bit simpler than they look like. So for instance, for the inductor current waveform, this whole sine function is multiplied by 0 because our DC source and the initial conditions, they are both the same value, so they cancel out each other. So this whole thing is going to be 0. And for the, for the resonating cap voltage, again, this component is 0. So technically, you can argue that 
uh, in the first mode, uh, in this mode, basically ILR is nothing but a cosine function. that it starts at T1 and then you can argue that VCR is nothing but a sine function plus a DC component that it starts at T equals to T1 which is the beginning of this mode alright so, so something like that so I'm just going to draw these two waveforms over here so ILR is a cosine function, and uh, let me uh, just draw that. Unfortunately, my scale is not very good. Uh, let me draw VCR first. So VCR is basically a sine function plus some DC source of VN. We can argue that. So technically, we have it. We have a we have a sine function writing this DC value of Vn, so all I have to do is just oops, control. Copy. Mm. All right, so I'm just gonna superimpose this and just follow this and this mode is going to continue as long as uh, VCR is returning its positive as soon as it returns back to zero you can say oh I was looking for ZVS and the voltage has returned back to zero so maybe this is a good time for me to turn the switch off basically so T2 marks the time that VCR is coming back to zero and that's actually a good time to turn the switch actually turn the switch on all right let me move this one as well as I have to scale it a little bit as well. <coughs> okay. So as I said, uh, ILR is nothing but a cosine function, so I'm actually plotting this cosine function. Okay, something like this. Oh, like this. All right. So this is the only mode that we actually have a resonance going on in the system. So a couple of observations. One of them is, oh, what is the peak value of VCR? Because in the end, VCR and the voltage of the switch are the same, basically, uh, signal. So when it comes to selecting a switch that can tolerate the peak value of the voltage, we should see actually how much it is. So this peak value is... Vn, which is the DC value, plus um, the amplitude of the sine signal, which is Z0, I0. Naught. So remember, I0 naught or I0 is the output current, I out, and Z0 is the characteristic impedance. Uh, the other thing is, if you want to have ZVS for the switch, we got to make sure this sine signal actually returns back to zero. That means in terms of amplitude, the amplitude of this sine function should be larger than its DC bias. So this is actually a design equation that we always have to consider. All right. So we pretty much know how much power we want to deliver to the load, so I out is almost determined. V in is usually provided to us, so this gives us an equation to find out the right range for Z0, which is the square root of LR over CR. And, okay, what's happening to Vx? Not as much is happening to Vx because the diode is on this in this mode. So basically, as long as Vx is concerned, nothing is going on, it's just zero. All right. Now, in terms of finding the duration of this mode, we just have to focus, for instance, the description of VCR and see at what time instant it becomes zero, and that gives you, gives you the length between T2 and T1. 
So we have it, an equation over here, and uh, here it is basically. T2 minus T1. And please don't, don't use this top one because it may give you the wrong answer. Pi plus the inverse sine of Vn. All right, something like that. So one thing to remember is the distance between T2 and T1 is more than 180 degrees or more than pi radians. Right, just keep that in mind when you're getting a, like a negative number, definitely it's not true. All right, so that's pretty much all is going on in this mode. Uh, now we are moving to the next mode, and that's actually when the, uh, we are going to turn the switch on. Or if you have this diode in the system, remember earlier I mentioned we may or may not have this diode. If we don't have this diode over here, you can argue that, okay, the voltage across the switch has returned back to zero. So this is a good time to turn the switch on and actually enjoy or benefit from the ZVS operation. Or if you have this diode, you can argue that, okay, the diode is going to kick in and start conducting some current. And as long as this diode is on, because it's a relatively ideal diode and the voltage drop across the diode is a small, you have a window of opportunity to turn your switch on. Because the diode is on, there's no voltage drop over there, and you can turn the switch on. When you turn the switch on, it is not immediately going to conduct current because the diode is still on, but your ZVS has already achieved. So you can go basically both ways with that. Now before we get into that, all we have to do is find the final conditions for this mode, which are the initial conditions for the second, for the following mode, which is the third mode. So uh, if you look at these curves, the only thing that is not basically zero is actually ILR at this particular time. So once I find T2 minus T1, I have a numerical value for that. I just plug that in for the expression for ILR, and that gives me ILR at, at time equals T2. So, um, and here is actually the expression. So, I out, which is our output current on average, DC value of the inductor current, times cosine of omega naught T2 minus T1. So this is the initial condition for my next mode, basically. Or the inductor current and the, the resonating inductor current at the end of this mode. Uh, one last observation is, please pay attention that ILR, which happens to be our, also our input current. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, meaning that if you have a source over there, uh, this short source should be able to handle negative currents as well, because sometimes we are getting current out of the source, sometimes we are pushing current back to the source. So if this is a, for instance, solar panel, it's not going to work unless we have some sort of a cap in parallel with that. If your source is a battery, fine, it is going to work. If your source is a switch mode power supply, again, depends on the structure, how much capacitance it has on the output side, uh, it may or may not work. Uh, the other thing that you may want to pay attention to, to, to is, what is, the, what is the minimum value of this, basically, over here? And this is going to be negative, I naught. So because of this resonance behavior, the current of the resonating inductor, which is the same as the input current or the source current, it is actually swimming, swinging from a positive value of I out to a totally negative value of I out. All right, before we get to the next mode. All right, so what happens in the next mode? So In the next mode, what happens is, let me just draw it over here. So let's say we have this switch, and I'm considering the diode as well. And I know that in this particular mode, ILR is negative, pushing the current in the opposite direction. And the diode is still on. And here is the output inductor. All right, 
So we are pushing current back to the source. And uh, you can argue that if there is a diode there, the diode is going to turn on. If there is no diode, it is our responsibility to basically turn the switch on because it's the best time to turn the switch on. Why? Because the voltage of the switch has returned basically to zero. All right. All right. So, uh, but you can argue that, oh, what if there is a diode there? If there is a diode, the diode is going to be on and the voltage of the switch is still going to remain at zero. So we have a window of opportunity. And how is that? So technically, I can say either my diode is on or either I have turned the switch on. Either way, I have a short circuit path here. So this, this mode that is just a starting, which is our third mode, uh, there is no cap in the picture anymore. The resonating cap is out because we are shorting it either via the diode or by turning the switch on. So technically, the circuit is reduced down to something like this. So now you can see there is no resonance going on. Basically, we are applying a positive voltage across this resonating inductor, and the, the current of this resonating inductor is going to ramp up. How far is it going to go as long as the current of this diode is in this direction in a positive way? If, if, we, if this thing keeps going up, there's going to be a time that this current is going to reach this current and want to reverse it in polarity, and that's actually the end of the smoke. So technically, ILR is going to ramp up. Okay. All right. So ILR is going to ramp up. It, initially, it's negative, no problem. It's just going to ramp up with a negative initial value. And finally, this is going to last as long as ILR is less than I out. Because if ILR tends to get larger than I out, that means the diode has to, re to, to reverse, to conduct in the you know, reverse polarity, and that's not going to happen. All right. And obviously, in this mode, the diode is on, or we have turned the switch on, or a combination of both these two. So technically, not this, nothing is really going on here. It's just zero. All right. So you can argue that this, if, if you have a diode in the system, from here to here, the diode is going to you know, conduct regardless. And uh, this is a good window for you to turn your switch on, basically, so that you're actually achieving ZVS for the switch at turn on. So we have ZVS, ZVS for the switch. I turn on. All right. Again, we are turning the switch on, but that doesn't indicate that it is immediately going to conduct. If there's a diode there, maybe the diode is going on. For instance, if this is an IGBT, the IGBT does not even support current, negative current. So the diode is going to be on, but the switch has been turned on at ZVS, basically. And. Um, all right, so this is as long as this mode is concerned, and you can argue that if you turn the switch on at a very particular point, it can also achieve both ZVS and ZCS because there is no current going through the, the, through the switch because the diode is on, and you know, we can argue for hours about this. Is it ZVS, is it ZCS, is it a combination of both? What happens to the diode, what happens to the switch? All right. And mode, uh, this is the end of this mode, so all I have to do is just find out the duration of this mode. So the duration of this mode is as if I tell you we have an inductor, a resonating inductor, we have the value of the inductor, we applied a positive of Vn across this inductor, how long does it take for the current of this inductor to rise from this initial value, which was I out times cosine or sine, I think it was cosine, I out times cosine of omega naught times T2 minus T1 as the initial value, all the way rises to I out. So this is actually the duration of this mode. 
and we have an expression here for that. which is basically this one. All right. So T3 minus T2 is the amount of time that has to pass for the inductor current to rise. Uh, what is happening to Vx? Vx is still 0 because the diode is still conducting. All right, the, the main diode in the system is conducting to the main diode of the converter. All right, so this mode ends when the diode turns off. So technically, uh, this current will reach as equal to I out, and there is no reason for the diode to conduct anymore, so the diode turns off. So that is actually our fourth mode. that we have done a smart thing. We have already turned the switch on at ZVS conditions during mode 3. So the switch is on. And just at the beginning of this mode, diode turned off. So technically, your circuit diagram is something like this. We turn the switch on in the previous mode. We have the resonating inductor. All right, so now there's no resonance is going on because the switch is on. The resonating cap is out of the picture. And all that is happening is the resonating inductor is basically conducting the same amount of current as the output current. And if you look at this voltage drop over here, assuming that the output current is constant, therefore there is no voltage drop over here. So Vx and Vn are the same. So in the last mode, Vx and Vn are the same. So I'm just going to plot it over here. Something like this. And ILR is actually conducting the output current, which is I out. And obviously, the switch is on in this mode, so there is no voltage drop across the switch. All right? And we can keep this mode, you know, last as, one, as long as we want. So this is the only, the only mode that we can shorten or long, you know, make it longer depending on our, you know, required amount for the output voltage. So this is the only mode that we can control the length. All right. The the previous modes are pretty much determined by the system. For instance, for mode one was the amount of time that takes for this for CR, for the voltage of CR to rise from zero to V, and we can't really control that. That the system decides on that. Mode two was a result of a resonance. Mode three was the amount of time that takes for the resonating inductor to rise from some negative initial value to I out. So the this uh, last mode, mode number four is the only mode that we can control. So we can make this mode a little shorter or longer. And the bad thing is, once we do so, we are actually changing the, uh, on, you know, indirectly, we are actually changing the switching frequency as well. All right. Um, what else do we have here? All right, any questions? So that's actually the analysis of the four modes. Do we have any questions? So there's only resonance going on in the second mode. All right, so uh, now that we find out how the system works, now we want to find out the voltage transfer ratio of this converter. And it's quite actually easy, even though the system looks a little bit complicated. Uh, Remember, if we, in the classic Bach converter, uh, or any kind of converter, remember, let me just read right over here. OK, so this is the right-hand side of the Bach converter. You can always argue that. On average, there is no voltage drop across this inductor. 
Why? Because the current waveform of this inductor is zero. So on average, this is zero. All right. So if I apply KVL around the loop, I can say on average, this voltage and the output voltage are the same. So I can argue that on average, Vx is the same as V out. All right. Now I plotted the output voltage, the Vx voltage waveform. So all I have to do is actually look at this average value. And that's actually my output voltage. Uh, value. So, on average, I can argue that the average value of Vx is the same as the DC value of the output voltage. So, if you look at Vx, we have three modes. In the first mode, it is ramping down. So, Vx is Vn times 1 minus T over T1. In modes 2 and 3, Vx is 0. This is T2, by the way. OK. And in the last mode, it's just Vn. All right, so this is a very, very simple waveform. You can easily find its average value. So output voltage is the same as the average value of Vx, which is <coughs> something like this. So we have a triangle, we have a square, that's the average value, which is Vn. Okay, so V out is the output voltage, V in is the DC value of the input voltage, F is the switching frequency. One over the switching period, we can control that by controlling the length of the fourth mode. T3 is the duration of the first three modes, and T1 is the duration of the first mode, basically. So once we have the numerical value for T3 and T1, according to the parameters in the system, we can see how much output voltage we have generated. Um, now, if you try to plot this, uh, what, what, it, what it is going to look like is, let me just borrow it from this. Probably they have a graph somewhere around here. OK, it looks like something like this. So let me just. Copy it. Put it here. Oops. All right. So this is how our voltage transfer ratio looks like. Again, on the x-axis, we have the frequency or the switching frequency normalized by F naught. And remember, F0 is the resonance frequency. So Fs is the switching frequency. And F0 is omega naught over 2 pi. All right. So we can change the frequency and basically change the value, the DC value of the output voltage. On the y-axis, we have V out over V in, which is our gain rate, voltage gain ratio. And then we have this little R over here, which is, again, the load resistance normalized by Z naught. And remember, Z naught was the square root of LR over CR. OK. And you can see this little R is being used as a parameter. So depending on what load you are using, you can sweep different values. For instance, if a little r is 0.1, your voltage transfer ratio will be following this particular curve. 
and you can see if you are curious about okay what's happening at this point is beyond this point you are going to lose your zero voltage switching conditions basically or in other words uh, this voltage that has to return back to zero it doesn't return back to zero anymore it's a positive value so you lose ZVS so that's why these curves are not complete for covering the entire range there is an endpoint to them that's because because of that so we can argue that for instance if I change for this particular R value if I change the switching frequency from 40 percent to 60 percent of the resonance frequency the output voltage changes from this value to this value and the other interesting behavior is if you increase the switching frequency or shorten your switching period your output voltage is going to get smaller this was opposite of the previous case if you increase the switching frequency in the ZCS scheme your output voltage would increase over here your output voltage would decrease basically and then you can argue that okay what if my load changes and now okay for instance your load has become twice as what it was before maybe five times as what it was before and something like that so you can see that as your load resistance gets closer and closer to the characteristic impedance or little r is getting closer to one your zvs window is very little you know you don't have a lot of zvs basically window so that's it's not a good good design a good design would be having r only a small fraction your load resistance being only a small fraction of your characteristic impedance that's actually a better design because you have a very wide range of changing the switching frequency and therefore a very wide range to uh, acquire the required output voltage again remember at the end this is a buck converter so our voltage transfer ratio can never get higher than one obviously that's just because the nature of this converter is it's a buck converter so if you plot this uh, this equation that we have up here uh, you will get curves like that. All right, any questions? Uh, yes. Is there any way of determining that, uh, like, uh, in uh, when both the, uh, when the switch is turned on, then which is conducting, like, either the diode is conducting or the switch is conducting? Yes, well, it depends. If this is a MOSFET, okay, so let's just talk about that a little bit. If your switch is actually a MOSFET, All right, and this MOSFET, whether you like it or not, has this bulk anti-parallel diode. Okay, so the question is, when this current is negative, and let's say we have already activated the gate to turn on to conduct for the switch, which one is going to conduct? Is it the switch, or is it the diode? Basically, is it the MOSFET or is it the diode? So it just comes down to the volt ampere characteristic of this MOSFET, uh, this diode, and the internal resistance of this, of this MOSFET. If the current is so little, and therefore this voltage drop is a smaller than the voltage drop of the diode, if the diode were, were to conduct, then the diode is not going to turn on because the voltage drop is less than the threshold voltage for the diode to turn on. However, if the amount of the current that you have is very large, and for instance, if you just assume that the MOSFET is going to turn on and conducting, you are going to have one volt of voltage drop over there, and that's, a, oh, oops, I have, a, I have a diode over here that is not even allowed for that voltage to rise to one volt, so the, the diode is going to turn on. So there's a competition between the diode and the MOSFET of which one is going to conduct. Now, if you have an IGBT, now IGBTs do not support negative current. That's it. They don't conduct current from, in this particular way that I have drawn it, from right to left, the IGBT is never going to conduct. So, always guaranteed that this current is going to go through the diode. All right? But you can still turn the switch on. The switch has been turned on. It's ready to conduct, but there is no possibility for the switch to conduct because the current is negative. As soon as the current tends to get basically positive, 
the IGBT kicks in and the diode turns off. So basically there is going to be, if you are using an IGBT, there is going to be a commutation between the diode and the di IGBT at this point. Before that the current is negative, it's the diode that is on. Right after that, it's the IGBT that is on. And then you can argue that, oh, at this point, I have ZVS and ZCS for the IGBT. And uh, ZVS and ZCS also for the diode turn off. So it's actually a good situation over there. All right. Other questions? Okay, so we don't have any questions. Let's have a numerical example. This numerical example comes directly from the book. And here it is. Uh, so we have this uh, resonant zero voltage switching resonant buck converter. And the input voltage is 20 volts. <coughs> the resonating inductor is 1 micro Henry's. And the resonating cap is 0 0.047 micro. You can see these LR and C are relatively small components. And the output current is 5 amps. Now, determine the switching frequency such that V out should be 10 volts. So if you want to have an output voltage that is half the input voltage, what would be the switching frequency? All right. So in DZ, you know, kind of examples and problems. First thing that you do is find LR and omega, omega naught and Z naught, because whether you like it or not, you're going to have to use them at some point. So it's always good to start with them. So omega naught is the resonance frequency between LR and CR. It turns out to be 4.6 mega radians per second. And Z naught, which is the square root of LR over CR, is like about four, four and a half ohms, something like that. And then in order to, f uh, so right now we have the output voltage, the desired output voltage is 10, the input voltage is 20, so pretty much it is hinting us to use this equation over here, the voltage transfer ratio basically. So it's basically hinting us to use this equation. So in order to use this equation, we have to find T1 and T3. And fortunately, we have all the parameters that we need to basically find them. For instance, for T1, remember T1 was the duration of time that took for the resonating cap to raise its voltage from 0 to v, v in. So it's V in over V in over I out, which is the slope times CR, basically. So we have pretty much all the the numbers that we need, and T naught, T1, turns out to be about 0.2 microseconds. So I want to bring this to your attention that T1 is a very short period of time. Why is that? Because uh, CR is a small cap. So this waveform that I have over here, and it takes a relatively long time for T1 to happen, actually in reality it doesn't happen like this. So in reality, if you build this converter, it is like something like that. So you can't even identify there is a breaking point over here, okay? There's a transition from mode 1 to mode 2. So remember, T1 is actually a very small, uh, you know, period of time. All right, so that was T1. Then we can look at the duration of the second mode and look at the duration of the third mode which ultimately gives us T3. So the duration of the second mode was T2 minus T1 was uh, 1 omega naught, and please don't use this equation, use it this way, pi plus. All right, something like this. And uh, again, you have to plug in the numbers. We know how much output voltage we need. It's 10. We found the characteristic impedance to be 4.61. And we know how much output current we need is 5 amps. So we pretty much have everything. And this turns out to be, uh, OK, I don't have the numerical value for this, but I have the numerical value for T2 which is 1.1 basically, okay? 
<laughs> and finally for T3, remember the equation that we had was T3 minus T2 is... So it's pretty much it's a hefty equation, but most of it is basically the initial conditions. Okay. We just found T2 minus T1. I don't have the numerical value, but it's somewhere around here. Like we are, we just found T2 minus T1. We can just plug it in over here, and. Uh, we know what the value of the resonating inductor is. I out is 5 amps, V in is 20 volts. And again, I don't have the numerical value for this, but ultimately T3 is going to be 1.47 microseconds, okay? So now that we have T3 and T1, we can plug them in in that voltage transfer ratio equation, which was something like this. And the only thing that is missing, or we are looking for, is the switching frequency. So the switching frequency turns out to be 363 kilohertz. So under these conditions, in order to achieve an output voltage of 10 volts with an output current of 5 amps, our switching frequency should be 300 kilohertz. It's a little bit higher than the switching frequencies that you have seen in the past. Usually we are talking about 100 to 200 kilohertz when it's hard switching. Because this is a soft switching scheme, you can push up the switching frequency just a little bit because there's not going to be as much uh, switching losses in the system. Uh, part B is asking about uh, uh, DS. Okay. What I forgot to mention is when it comes to labeling these components, we have two diodes in the system basically. One is the main diode of the topology this one over here, which is labeled just a classic D as diode. And this one over here, because it's a diode anti-parallel with the switch, is called D sub S, basically. All right. So part B is asking about what is the voltage drop on that v, uh, DS, basically, or the switch, basically, because it's parallel with the switch as well. All right. So if you remember, in order to find this, what we have to do is we have to focus on VCR, basically. So in the first mode, it rises to VN, and then there is a resonance going on, and this peak would be VN plus Z naught I out, okay? So again, we have all the numbers. V out is 10, Z naught was 4.6 ohms, and I naught was 5 amps, so you can see that your switch should be able to handle 43 volts, which is a bad thing over here because our input voltage is only 20 volts. In the classic buck converter, if you were using a classic buck converter over here, you had to pick a switch that can handle 20 volts. But over here, because you're doing ZVS, you have to pick a switch that can handle 43 volts, which is higher. So the indication over here is, yes, we have achieved ZVS, and ideally our switching losses have reduced, but now we have to go and buy a switch that can block a higher amount of voltage. And that switch, unfortunately, have a larger internal resistance. So yes, your switching losses have reduced, but then your conduction losses are going to increase. So there is actually a trade-off here involved. So this 43 volts compared to the classic buck that is only 20 is actually a disadvantage of this topology. All right, speaking of disadvantages, what about the ID max? Okay, so remember we have this diode in the system. And we want to see on, in terms of maximum value, what, how much current has, is, is going to pass through this diode. Um, we did not actually plot the waveform of this diode current. However, okay, if you see the three graphs that we plotted over here, ID is not there, but always pay attention that if this is ILR and this is I out, 
then ID is basically apply case seal over here and find ID. So ID is basically I, I out minus ILR. All right. So if I have ILR, if you just reverse it and add it with I out, that gives me ID. And that's actually the graph that I plotted over here. In the first mode, the diode was off. In the second mode, there was a resonance going on. And in the third mode, it's just ramping down. <coughs> All right. So what is this peak value? This is twice the output current. All right. The output current is 5. So this would be 10 amps. Another disadvantage over here, if this were a classic buck, our diode, in terms of peak value of conduction, uh, would only have to handle 5 amps. Over here, it has to handle twice as much current in terms of peak value of the current. Or you can actually do some RMS analysis and actually find out more, more about it. And finally, for, uh, part D is asking about um, what would be our output voltage if we selected, uh, you know, R, which is the load value, over Z0 to be 0.1, and then the switching frequency over the resonance frequency to be 0.45. So we haven't changed the value of uh, LR and CR. We have just changed the switching frequency and the load value, and even I out is still the same. And... Uh, so technically, you have to, we have to look at this graph. So all I am doing over here is I'm using this graph over here. I am just saying that R over Z0 is 0.1. So the indication is I'm going to use this curve. This is, this is giving me 0.1. And also, F over F0 is 0.45, which is somewhere around here. So you can see that your voltage transfer ratio would be around 0.3. So the input voltage is 20, so the output voltage should be around 6. Okay. So the output voltage is basically 6. So sometimes if you have this graph available, uh, we can just look at the graph and say, oh, if I change this and change that, how much my output voltage is going to look like? Assuming, but uh, we have to be very careful about, for instance, I out. Is it constant? Is it variable? Those kind of things. All right, any questions? So uh, this was all about the buck converter. If you want to achieve zero voltage switching for the switch, and if the byproduct of that would be there is some soft switching actually features introduced for the diode as well. So for instance, when we were focusing on the diode, for instance, Vx is the reverse of the voltage of the diode. So you can argue that here the diode is turning on and the voltage of the diode is zero. So we have ZVS for the diode at turn on. Unfortunately, again, depends on how this diode is turned off. Is it really turning off here, or is this like somewhere here, and then the switch is turned on? You can argue that you probably have a ZVS at turn off of the diode as well, as well as ZCS, uh, you know, those kind of things. So in terms of soft switching, we are achieving our goal, but there is a general problem associated with these topologies that you achieve ZVS, and reduce your switching losses, but at the same time, you are, in terms of voltage, you're overstressing your components, like here, a lot of voltage stress on our switch, and even in terms of current, we are overstressing our components, uh, like we were looking at ID, or even sometimes your source should be able to handle negative amounts of current. So you can see uh, it fixes a problem one place and then adds more problems somewhere else. Usually these topologies are good when you don't have a lot of variations in the desired output voltage or even the load value. So that means you have to, you just design the system for a very specific operating point 
and the application is in a way that your operating point is not really changing much. But if you have a wide range of variations in your input voltage or a wide range of variations in your output power, then you're in trouble and you can really use this because it's really hard to achieve ZVS for the entire range of variations. All right. So uh, let's go to the book and see what the book has to offer. It's pretty much uh, looking at different operating modes. Uh, so I see that this, this figure is actually better than the previous one. I can't really find any mistakes over here. So this is the first mode. Just pay attention that this is actually a straight line. It's not part of a resonating thing. And then we have a resonance going on. And also this is just a straight line. All right, something like that. Um, so the book actually analyzes different operating modes. And ultimately, the, the voltage transfer ratio that we found. And we already used this one. OK, so the book immediately jumps to the, another topology. So these two topologies that we analyzed, some people classify them as switch resonant converters. Now, why is that? Because we are adding this resonating cap and resonating inductor like around the switch and the diode. Now, there is another category of converters or inverters in which we don't really add anything ar around our switches. We add the resonating components around our load. So this is our load over here. We are trying to deliver some AC power to this load. And we are adding a resonating inductor and a resonating capacitor in series with this load. So we call these converters load resonant converters because the resonating components have been added around your where you're consuming power, not where you're switching, basically. And you can see the switches are just, just regular switches. There is nothing added, just, the, for instance, an IGBT over there and the anti-parallel diode that you have added, or maybe a MOSFET over here and a diode, basically. So if you look at this topology, this is our, actually our H-bridge. We use this as an inverter. So if I just eliminate L with a short circuit and eliminate cap with a short circuit, I just have a just the H-bridge inverter. And then depending on how I switch this, if do I use a square shape switching or do I use PWM switching, I can actually have different way, different waveforms in my output voltage. Now what we want to study now is we want to do a square shape voltage switching. So basically before, when our load was just a resistor, we could generate a kind of a square shape load across this resistor. Then we analyze that. What if we add an inductor in series with that? And then you, you could see that, for instance, our current became a little bit like an exponential kind of a thing. Now we want to reanalyze this under the assumption that we have added a resonating inductor and a resonating cap in series with this load. What is going to happen on these, uh, on these conditions? All right. So I'm going to go back to my notes. So, um, oops. So we are moving on from Bach converter, the two examples that we had, ZVS and ZCS, which are called switch resonant converters, to load resonant converters. All right. So what I have over here drawn is the same as what we had on the slide. We just have an H bridge. And over here, in series with our resistive load, we have a resonating cap and a resonating inductor. Now, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so I'm actually going to analyze this next time. Uh, so uh, there is a simple resonating thing going on. And uh, uh, yeah, we can actually take a look at it next time. So please remember about your quiz two weeks from today. After the Thanksgiving break, we are going to have a quiz. And so far, the material that is going to be covered in the quiz is Buck converter with ZVS and Buck converter with ZCS, the ones that we have already totally covered. The sign-up sheet is circulating. It's all right over here. If you were late, don't forget to sign it.